Chapter 12 The past intruded when she wanted only the present, wanted these two weeks before she left the city. The past came and lined up before her, demanding recognition. The time before she started working in Ray's department. She worked in languages and sometimes translated things for the council. English to Arabic, leaflets about the health services, about classes in English. An incident from that time, a Libyan woman in hospital in summer was asked to go to Forrester Hill and interpret for her. The woman didn't know English and her husband who did was away offshore. But Summer refused to go. She could not face the hospital after, after Tariq. And she drowned her guilt about the Libyan woman in oceans of sleep. In her dreams, she forgot that Tariq had died. Her head in the languages department was a woman named Jennifer, who one day unexpectedly and abruptly called Summer, asked her to sit down and said that she was not religious, but respected people who were religious. That was during the Gulf War when suddenly everyone became aware that Summer was Muslim. Once a man shouted at her in King Street, Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein. Jennifer said, my boyfriend is Nigerian and paused as if that statement had a deeper meaning she wanted Summer to grasp. Summer sat and nodded politely. She felt like a child who had stayed up too late at night and was discovering that in the adult world there were things she could not understand. Jennifer talked away fresh and brisk, reassuring her of how broad-minded and tolerant she was, not like so many people. For example, Jennifer said, I have no problem at all with the way you dress. When Summer finally spoke, she managed thank you and went home and slept. She slept deeply and continuously until the next day. It was part of her remit to work for other departments if they needed her. This was how she met Ray when he sent her articles from Arab newspapers, the aftermath of the Gulf War. The first, time, the first time she went to see him, he surprised her by being not rushed for time, not distracted by other things. She was used to busy people, a tightness in time. Instead, after discussing the newspaper articles, he told her about the time he lived in North Africa and asked her about her name, an unusual name. Lulled by his manner, she said, There is a Lebanese ladies' magazine called Summer and immediately thought, what a silly thing to say, what an inappropriate thing to say. But he didn't look surprised or amused. He said quite seriously, I have not come across this magazine. People sp spoke about him, his student, his secretary, Yasmin. It was through him that Summer met Yasmin, Yasmin who talked so fluently and knowingly about the Gulf War, immigration, these people she told Summer that Ray had been on television several times and on the radio during the war. She would come to work the following morning and the department's answering machine would be jammed with messages, angry voices. You are a disgrace to our universities. We pay taxes. You don't know what you're talking about. Fighter planes aren't enough for this war. We need to drop an atomic bomb once and for all. And after a radio program, is this war a holy war, you wog bastard? May I remind you that England is a Christian country and it would be a good thing if you and all of the rest of the odious wog bastards were to go back to the land of Allah. Since you bastards came to England, this country has become the asshole of the West. Summer remembered Yasmin telling her all this in the car one Saturday on the way to a DYI shop. Yasmin mimicking the man's London accent. Did Ray get upset? Summer had asked. No, he laughed. And Summer pictured the scene of the, in the secretary's office. Yasmin replaying the tape first thing in the morning. Ray standing still wearing his jacket because he had just come in. Some of the blinds in the room would still be drawn. The department still sluggish. No footsteps of students. A few members of staff coming in to check their mail, mumbling greetings, lingering at the sound of the tape. 
Ray would have listened to the unclear voice on the tape, the message left for him, then laughed alone, for no one else would laugh, and wiped his face with his hand. Thirteen days to go. Her date of departure loomed ahead, solid as rock, impressive as a mountain. The days were numbered. They dwindled, and by their nature could not increase. But they were not normal days. They expanded as if by magic. They stretched out like trees, and the hours passed like the hours of a child. They did not flicker or melt deceptively away. She thought that it was not true what people said. The time passed quickly when you were happy and passed slowly when you were sad. For, for on her darkest days after Tariq died, grief had burned away time, devoured the hours effortlessly, the days in chunk after chunk. Now every day stretched, a lo stretched along, and when Ray spoke to her a few words, when they only saw each other for a few minutes, these minutes expanded and these words multiplied and filled up time with what she wanted to talk with her, to take with her, what she did not want to leave behind. My last 12 days, my last 10 days. He said it, were, it was her soup. Her soup was the catalyst that made him recover. He was back working a full day. He no longer coughed. She said, Allah is the one who heals. She wanted him to look beyond the causes to the first, the real. When I was young, he told her, there were books that did not impress me much. Picture books of angels with blue eyes and wings, naive animals in pairs boarding a ship, too many fluffy clouds. When she was young, there were the words of the Qur'an, no pictures of angels, words to learn by heart and recite in treacherous streets where rabid dogs barked too close. Say, I take refuge in the Lord of Daybreak. Say, I take refuge in the Lord of Humans. And at, and at night, too, inside the terrifying dreams of childhood, she had said the verses to push away what was clinging and cruel. He said, That is real, nothing trivialized, diminished to the status of fairy tales. And he looked disappointed when he said that, distracted by thoughts he would only condense for her. History diminished, diminished the status of fairy tales, he said, covered with illusions, grid lines, rules. She said that she had imagined the freedom in this part of the world, not rules, not restrictions, but she tried to understand, to take in this new picture he was describing, a sketch of the Scottish church and state, Calvinism, a dour and oppressive brand of Christianity, an upbringing so different from hers, things he was told. He must not be sullen, he must not be cheeky, he must not be contradictory. He must not complain of boredom. Only bores get bored. The value of pretending that all was well when it wasn't. Such pretense was an art, a form of courage. Don't think too much. Line up. You are too intense. She said, I never knew that to be intense was something bad. You are lucky, he said, and smiled as if he loved her encouragement to speak again the stray dogs the threat of rabies cholera bilarzia lepers like in films and a day in may when the whole school was inoculated against meningitis the injections shot of a, out of a pistol girls fainting in the sun a time when she belonged to a particular place before she knew the feeling this has nothing to do with me these shops these people have nothing to do with me this guy is not for me. Times when she was silent but never detached, watching her aunt rub the luxury of Nivea on her legs, the white cream disappearing into her skin over the sketch of bluish veins, over her ankles, the polish of her nails, her aunt's face so serious, this was something important, necessary, not a game. Can I put cream on too? But she must wash her legs first, otherwise the cream would all get mixed up with the dust. 
in the garden Tarek was drinking from the hose pipe so when it was her turn she drank too the water was warm not cold like the water from the fridge not smelling of food she could drink and drink this water and never feel full wash her hands her legs up to her knees the water splashed on the mud of the flower beds made a path into the garden Tarek climbed the low wall balanced I fixed your bicycle, he said. There was the sound of the water, a distant car, a few birds. There was the voice of the cook sitting in the shade of the guava tree reading the Quran, his shoulders swaying back and forth with the words. Loneliness is Europe's malaria, Ray said. No one can really be immune. This is not so hygienic a place. Don't be taken in by the idols it makes of itself. You might even come to feel sorry for it, just a little, not too much for there is no injustice in this decay. I am anxious, he said, that when you go back home you will realize that I am much cruder than you, that I am not as you think me to be. My last Friday. He showed her the card that his daughter sent him when he was in hospital. Get well soon, Dad, the card said, and it had a picture of a bandaged bear. Summer found the wording strange without I wish or I pray. It was an order, and she wondered if the child was taught to believe that her father's health was in his hands, under his command. But she did not share her thoughts and instead admired the school photograph that Vari had sent with the card. The uniform was a tartan kilt, a matching jumper and tie. She stood out from among the rest of her class because she was his daughter and looked a little like him. Whom does she re resemble more, you or her mother? Summer asked, but he was not keen to follow this line of conversation. Of the reasons for the breakup of his marriage, she could only guess. If she asked him directly, she knew she would not be fulfilled with the concise, measured answer he would give. So on her own, she looked inside, lifted up the veils that blocked her vision. One veil, he could not make anyone unhappy. Another veil, to leave him, that woman must have a low IQ. Finally, in the deep, she caught sight of the truth. His stubbornness and a wife with a successful career who earned more money as a bureaucrat with the UN than he did as a professor in a provincial university. A woman who grew tired of traveling back and forth from Geneva to Edinburgh to see her daughter in boarding school, then to see him in Aberdeen. He would not go with her to Geneva. Geneva, he said, was too neat and for him there were only three places in the world, Scotland, North Africa, the Middle East. The woman, after a snipe, remarked too many. The UN is a sham and everyone knows it. After a quarrel too many, I spent five miserable years with you in stinking Cairo, sat down alone one day with a coffee and a cigarette and asked herself, what exactly do I need him for? My last Saturday, my last Sunday, he phoned her, but they could not speak for long. On the landing, people came and went, banged the door. A girl with long, greasy hair stood behind Summer and wanted to use the payphone, too. Summer wished she did not live in a place like that. She wished that she could be settled with a telephone in a kitchen that was her own. She could talk and at the same time wipe the crumbs off the table, turn the cooker off. I must go, she whispered, but he would not let her go. He went on talking and she did not want to miss a single word. I have to go. Behind her, the girl with long hair huffed and blew with impatience. Are you going to be all day? Are you going to be all day? The girl had no mercy. It was not the same as when she and Ray had talked a month ago during the Christmas holidays when Summer had the building all to herself. Even at night, they could not talk. The stairs at nighttime were dangerous highways. Now and again the sounds of thumbs and heaving, shouts, snatches of songs. Someone vomited on the bottom stairs. 
curry and beer on the same place where Summer had put her cushion and sat speaking to Ray. My last Monday, when she heard from everyone except him, lucky you to get away from all this dreadful weather we've been having lately. You must be so happy you're going to see your son again. How many years since you've been back? Four, four years? That is a long time. My last Tuesday. At that early time of the morning, the senior common room was quiet. Apart from Summer and Ray, there were two men and a lady with curly blonde hair who had slid their mugs of coffee down the metal rail to the cashier and sat under the no smoking sign. In this room, Summer liked the tall windows that looked out over the other university buildings, the way the grass curved upwards to the road, the white dome of engineering shaped like a mosque. Would she remember these things? The way Ray tore open a packet of sugar? Would she remember that in a place where there were no packets of sugar? Or his jacket? Would she remember its color in a place where people had no need of wool or jackets? The future whined for her attention. Picture the interviews in Egypt, young men smoking one cigarette after the other. Picture sun and dusty roads, shops not so well stocked, shabby cars and shabby clothes, undecorated rooms. Picture them all. Soon they'll be... You're already away from me. He said, as if he could hear the future whining, as if he could see the future pulling at her hand. He watched her. He looked at her more than she looked at him. Cups of tea held her attention. Smooth, flawless plastic spoons. No, no, I'm still here. They were together at this uncomfortable time of the day to ring whatever time they could. What was left? In an hour, they would be engulfed by work and the voices of the people. They would be part of a bigger, churning whole, projects for her to hurry up and finish before she left, classes for him and the visit of Dr. Farid Khalifa from Sterling. They were writing a paper together which meant hours of discussion. She said, Yesterday when I spoke in Arabic to Farid, I felt that home was close. Yesterday she had met him in Ray's office, he was short and energetic looking with a beard and the habit of asking one question after the other, but she had not minded answering his questions, the curriculum vitae of her life. He had in turn told her about his wife who was a student, his three children who were in school. She had enjoyed talking in Arabic, words like inshallah fitting naturally in everything that was said, part of the sentences, the vision. How many times had she over the past days said in English, I'm leaving on Friday, and the sentence, normal and natural as it was to the people who heard it, had sounded in her ears incomplete, untruthful without insha'Allah. You were patient with all his questions, Ray said. Most people aren't. You are not? No, because you are secretive. He laughed and said, what makes you say that? She said, something you said once. You and Yasmin were talking about how schoolgirls in France were not allowed to wear hijab. Do you remember? Yasmin was angry. Yes, I remember. She remembered the November afternoon and feeling glad that Yasmin, who was giving her a lift home, was talking to Ray, not in any hurry to leave, not in a hurry to go home because Nazim was offshore and it had struck summer, that then that the three of them had no one expecting them at home, only voices that came out of radios and television sets. She talked about that day, finding a new past that was not shrouded in sleep, a recent past that could be pulled out, silk from a drawer to admire and touch. You said you liked my hijab, and I asked you why. It was the only thing I said the whole time. Yasmin doesn't give you much chances to speak, does she? She frowned. That's not fair. She does. Anyway, I asked you why you liked it, and you said because it's secretive. That is what you said. And that made you think that I am secretive? 
Yes. I was complimenting you, he said. Didn't you realize? She shook her head and looked out of the window at the winter sun on the dome of the engineering building. The noise of the room, cutlery being moved, set out the ventilator fan from the kitchen. If things were different, she would have smiled and asked, complimented me on what? And enjoyed the things he would have said, but she was afraid of confessions, emotional words, uneasy, meeting him. Talking to him had become a need she was not comfortable with. Yesterday, she had wondered if Farid had sensed, had guessed from the way Ray looked at her, from the way she spoke. She envied Farid because he was married and she was not, and marriage was half of their faith. When she turned away from the window, one of the catering ladies was walking around spraying the tables with polish and wiping them with a cloth. There were more people in the room, vaguely familiar, reading newspapers, eating breakfast before they started work. Something light to say. The tea is hot. Yasmin has a cold and she can't take anything for it because she's pregnant. Diane's mother is up from Leeds for a visit. Talk of work. Ask him about his student, his best student, the man from Sierra Leone. He's finishing up his thesis. Does he have a date set for his visa yet? She spoke about the Azhar thesis that she was working on. She had promised him that she would finish the introduction before she left. She said, A lot of the hadiths that are quoted have already been translated before, so I am working faster than I thought I would be. I am learning a lot, things I didn't know before. Here in Scotland, she was learning more about her own religion the world was one cohesive place. What things haven't you come across before? One hadith that says, The best jihad is when, when a person speaks the truth before a tyrant ruler. It is not often quoted and we never did at school. I would have remembered it. With the kind of dictatorship with which most Muslim countries are ruled, he said, it is unlikely that such a hadith would make its way into the school curriculum. But we should know. The good thing, he said, the balance is that you could know that the information is there. Governments come and go and they can aggressively secularize like in Turkey, where they wiped Islam off the whole curriculum, or marginalize it like they did most everywhere else, separating it from other subjects, from history even. But the Qur'an itself and the authentic hadiths have never been tampered with. They are there as they have been for centuries. This was the first thing that struck me when I began to study Islam. One of the reasons I admire it. Why did you begin to study it? He said, I wanted to understand the Middle East. No one writing in the 50s and 60s predicted that Islam would play such a significant part in the politics of the area. Even Fanon, who I have always admired, had no insight into the religious feelings of the North Africans he wrote about. He never made the link between Islam and anti-colonialism. When the Iranian revolution broke out, it took everyone here by surprise. Who were these people? What was making them tick? Then there was a rush of writing most of it misinformed, the threat that the whole region would be swept up in this very much exaggerated. But that is understandable to some extent because for centuries there had been a tense relationship between the West and the Middle East, since the 7th century when the Church denounced Islam as a heresy. Time was not generous. They looked at their watches at the same time, only a few minutes to nine. People were leaving the room. From the window, she could see students walking towards the buildings, going indoors. She said, What are the other reasons that you admire Islam? It will have to be one, it will have to be one reason for now, because there isn't much time. There are a number of theories. He began and she thought, He's talking to me like he talks to his students. She sometimes wished that she was one of his students, then she could listen to him for hours at a time. 
These theories explain why capitalism developed ultimately in Europe and not in other earlier civilizations which were much more sophisticated. Civilizations like Muslim Spain or the Ottoman Empire. One theory is that for capitalism to grow, there must be an accumulation of wealth through inheritance that comes from dynasties and families surviving over a long time. But the Sharia's laws on inheritance and charity fragmented wealth so so much that the necessary accumulation never took place. There was a blocking effect like an internal thermostat or switch that stopped this excess. I think of it as a balance, something that kept things reasonable, steady, and now I have to rush because I have a class. After he left, she sat for a few minutes playing with the plastic spoon in her empty cup. Why was it even that though he said such positive things, she was not completely reassured? Months ago, Yasmin had asked her, Are you hoping he would become a Muslim so you could get married? Hope that he would become, fear that he wouldn't, and then what? On the table, there was scattered sugar melting in tea stains, particles bouncing towards the anonymity of the carpet or stain to cling gritty and sweet on her fingers and clothes. Her last Wednesday.